Welcome to this podcast on the Gospel reading for Pentecost 7, uh, Series A, namely Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30, which is the parable of the weeds and the wheat, and then its explanation, which follows a few verses later, namely verses 36 to 43. Just to have a couple of introductory remarks before we jump into the Greek text. And those introductory remarks relate to how important it is to see the relationship between this parable and the parable that has occurred right before it. Jesus has already told the parable of the sower and the seed. And in that parable, he's talked about how the, the, the seed, which is the gospel of the kingdom, uh, has challenges in terms of bringing about the growth that it uh, seeks to bring about, uh, and yet it still does. Namely, in spite of the kind of challenges that the world uh, and Satan uh, give, yet people are brought into the kingdom. That seed brings the growth of faith and life in many Christians. So that's more in terms of how the church is established, how people become Christians. This parable builds on that, some of the same imagery of planting and growth, but it's more about the life of the church once you are in the church, that there is good seed growing, and yet there is also weeds that grow. So it's more of speaking about the life of the church after conversion, unlike the first parable that we've just uh, uh, heard the, the previous week. Let's pick up then this parable that is speaking about the weeds and the wheat and really emphasizing that we shouldn't go on witch hunting in the sense of looking for unbelievers, but our focus should be on nurturing the wheat, letting believers grow and mature in their faith, recognizing that in the end, God's the only one who can look in the heart and judge in terms of people who are believers and unbelievers, and he will in the last day in, in judgment. Uh, and that's uh, brought out in this parable. So let's turn to the Greek text. And you can see here, Jesus begins, or Matthew begins here, that uh, speaking about the fact that he taught another parable, that's a reference, obviously, to the parable of the sower and the seed that precedes um, uh, these verses. So this is the second in a series of several parables that are found in Matthew 13. Uh, and uh, you have then this parable being spoken of uh, here that he uh, relates, he hands over this parable to them, namely to his disciples. That's who he's teaching. This is one of the great teaching sections of Matthew chapter 13, uh, where it's really the, uh, the discourse on the kingdom. So several of these parables begin with this important phrase, uh, so he, he uh, hands this over to them saying, and what does Jesus say? The kingdom of the heavens, which is very stylistic in the Gospel of Matthew, is like, that um, homoi othe is like, it identifies that this story is an extended simile. Namely, we're understanding the functions of the kingdom, which is really about God's work in Jesus Christ, we're understanding it in light of this story about agriculture. And obviously, the great part of this particular uh, parable is that Jesus, in verses 36 to 43, helps us to understand each of these details because he gives the explanation, much like he did in that first parable in, the, in Matthew, namely the sower and the seed. So, the kingdom of the heavens uh, is like and here's the, the, the comparison. is like a man who uh, sowed, who after he had sowed good seed in his field. So this is um, the comparison, and this is an important uh, adjective right here. He sowed good seed, namely, he is not responsible, this sower, and we know from the, the sower and the seed parable, we know from Jesus' explanation here, he's speaking about the son as the man, the son of man, namely Jesus as the sower. So, and Jesus is not responsible for the weeds. Why? He sows kalon uh, sperma, good seed, seed that is productive, seed that brings about uh, the sons of the kingdom. 
and the field is his world. And he, so he goes out to his world, he sows seed, and it brings forth the sons of the kingdom. Uh, and then you have this phrase. It's an articular infinitive phrase. So you have the article, the infinitive, but it's also with this preposition, and, and it's really another way that you can express a temporal clause. So rather than using a participle, here you have an articular infinitive. While the men, the, uh, the subject of the infinitive is here in the accusative, uh, were sleeping, then the enemy, here's this, the, the main uh, uh, subject of the main clause, the enemy, his enemy, came, there's your verb for, for um, uh, the, the subject, the enemy, and what did he do? He sowed weeds. So you have this contrast between good seed and weeds. Again, uh, the man is responsible for the good seed, but here the enemy is the one that's responsible for the weeds. And he did it in the middle of, so uh, right alongside, right in the midst of, the wheat, so you have the contrast between weeds and wheat, and that's why this parable is often called the parable of the weeds and the wheat. Uh, those are the two nouns you see right here. Weeds right here, and wheat right here. And then he departed. So you have the enemy coming, doing this subversively, and then going off. And so you have then... When the plants, here we have the plants, when they come up um, and they make uh, fruit, namely the weed is bearing fruit, what else becomes manifested? Here you have that word for, for uh, manifest from phyno. Uh, what else becomes apparent or manifest? The weeds also become apparent. So you have... The, the people only thinking that there's good seed sown, but once things grow up, they, now they see also these, wheats, these weeds alongside the wheat. And then the question comes, you have the servants of the householder, uh, basically they're called slaves or servants. After they, um, they come, there's your participle, uh, they say to that householder, Lord, uh, and isn't it interesting? It's, we could translate it sir, but it's also appropriate in the sense that this is a referent to, um, to God as the householder or even to the son of man as the, the one who is in charge. So what did they say to, to him? They say, uh, Lord, uh, did you not sow right here uh, good seed? We saw that already right up here. In, um, in verse 24, uh, and, uh, and then uh, in your field, from where does the weeds, have, have they come? So where uh, have these weeds come from? That's just the basic question of the, the parable. Uh, and then you have the, um, the householder, namely the sower of the seed, which would be referencing Jesus, responding to them, saying, uh, basically, an enemy man, uh, this man, so uh, did this. Okay, So he's not responsible as the one who sold good seed, but it was the enemy. We hear later in Jesus' explanation that the enemy is specifically Satan. And then, uh, then you have the servants or slaves saying to him, uh, do you desire... And whenever you have that, we need to know what is it that uh, uh, they are asking about in terms of what is it that uh, they are desiring. Do you desire, therefore, that after we come, that we, um, um, shall we gather them? Here you have a deliberative subjunctive. Shall we gather then the weeds out from the field? So that's the basic question they're asking the householder. And this has to do, obviously, with uh, how, what is our attitude in light of um, the, the life of the church? What is our focus? And, uh, you know, should we just go in and pull up the weeds and disrupt the growth of others in the process? That's really uh, the question that uh, Jesus is using this parable to address. And then 
what does he respond? He responds here, uh, no, let them hear. Uh, the emphasis is that, uh, uh, that they should uh, do not basically uproot the weeds. You have this language here uh, in verse 29. Uh, and then he mentions here, uh, until you have, um, uh, just a minute here, verse 29. Yeah, he's emphasizing, lest in the, when you gather up the weeds, you also uproot the wheat. So here's your verb, you also uproot the, the wheat. So he wants to caution them not to do that. Why? because it's going to also impact the wheat, and obviously the wheat, as we see from the explanation, is referring to the sons of the kingdom. So, he says, what's his command? The householder commands him, leave, here you have the imperative, leave them, very important verb right here, grow together. You see the soon, together, and then the verb, uh, it's in the infinitive form here. Leave them together grow uh, until the, the harvest, and so this is emphasizing the end time harvest, and, uh, and when the time, the kairos right here, when the special time God has determined for the harvest um, uh, to come, then he will basically, uh, he, will, he will bring about that harvest. So he will be the one who determines the, the separation of these weeds from the wheat and he will bring judgment. And then he says, um, then uh, he will say to the harvesters, so basically in, in this phrase, when this time comes for the harvest, I will say, this is a reference to what uh, Jesus will say to the harvesters, go and gather, or go gather, um, first the weeds, and then the command is uh, to the, the harvesters is to, um, to um, burn them in the, um, well, actually to, um, just a minute, to, to um, tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles, that's what it is, and bind them into bundles, and then... You have the thing, uh, the um, pros ton plus the infinitive. So here you have the articular infinitive uh, in, in order to be burned. It's expressing the purpose. In order to, pros ton with the articular plus the infinitive, in order to be burned, in order to burn them. And then what do we do with the wheat? Uh, here the wheat is also uh, gathered into his barn, not to be destroyed, uh, but rather to be gathered into his barn. Now Jesus explains this, so if we, scale, uh, if we move the uh, text up, uh, I've already alluded to several of the, um, the, the meanings of uh, these verses, but here Jesus explains them very pointedly. So then he says, you have the emphasis here of, um, of uh, speaking to, in verse 36, uh, he left the crowds, namely Jesus left the crowds, and he went to the house, and then that's where you have his disciples coming to him and now wanting a private explanation. And what do they say? Explain here to us the parable of the weeds in the field. So they didn't fully understand that, uh, that, that parable and its reference. So here Jesus answers them, and what does he say? The sower of the good seed, notice the, the adjective there, the good seed is the Son of Man. So that's a self-reference to Jesus. He is the key sower of, and obviously through the apostolic ministry, many others sow, and in, through their sowing of the seed, other Christians also spread that seed namely the gospel of the kingdom. And you have in verse 38, uh, he, he mentions the field is the world. So the, the, 
The seed is to be scattered all over the world, every tribe, nation, people, and language. Uh, it's to be shared. The gospel is a, has universal significance. And the emphasis is that the good seed that's sown, this is the sons of the kingdom. So this brings about um, believers who are members of his kingdom. The kingdom of God is like, and it's a seed that's sown. It results in people who then become sons of the kingdom. Why sons? Because all sons receive the inheritance. So whether male or female, we're all sons of the kingdom. And then the contrast is the weeds here are the sons of the evil one. And here, not just sons of evil, but the sons of the evil one. Uh, just from the Lord's Prayer, we know that phrase very well in Matthew. It's a reference to Satan. And that's uh, made clear also here. And so the enemy here is a specific reference. The one who is sowing participle, uh, them, namely sowing the sons of the kingdom, is whom? None other than the, the diabolos, namely Satan himself. You have Satan, devil, used interchangeably in the Gospels, and uh, so that's uh, present here. And uh, uh, then you have the mention of the harvest. What is the harvest? That's the end of the age, the culmination of the age, the last day. And then he also explains here that the harvesters are the angels. And here it would be a reference to the good angels that come with Christ, i.e. Matthew 25. The angels come, the Son of Man seated, and, and uh, there is universal judgment. So similar scene that he's explaining here. So then in verse 40, we have the uh, mention, and here you have a nice little contrast. Host pair, hutos, just as, so also. So just as the weeds are, uh, are gathered, uh, and then you have them being thrown into the fire, so also, so there's a way of comparison, so also you have, uh, this will be on the last day, at the culmination of the age, uh, there will be this kind of judgment against those who are sons of the evil one. Then you have in verse 41, uh, what will happen, the Son of Man, again, that's a reference to Jesus, uh, Daniel 7 is obviously the background for that. What does he do? He sends his angels. So he's explaining the, um, the, the imagery uh, that's, uh, of the, the parable. Uh, he sends his angels, and they are the ones who then gather, there you have your verb, uh, into his kingdom. Um, and that's a reference, obviously, to his eternal kingdom. All of the, uh, well, here, actually, it's, Ek, I should point this out. It's not into his kingdom. They gather from his kingdom. He has brought, he has made the world his kingdom because he's bought it back. And now he's taking out of the world all of the ones, so this is speaking about the judgment activity, who have, are um, basically uh, uh, stum stumblers, namely the ones who have caused others to stumble. This is, this is talking about... Uh, uh, the, the, uh, those who are rebellious and the ones who are doing, participle, the anomion, the lawless thing. So these are uh, those who are sons of the evil one. And he's taking them out of his kingdom. And what does he do? He throws them into uh, the, the furnace of fire right here. The furnace of fire. So this is emphasizing judgment. Matthew um, records Jesus' strong words of eschatological or end-time judgment. Here is a good example of that. And uh, there, what is there? There is the weeping one and the gnashing of teeth one. Namely, there are the people who are the weeper, the, who are weeping and the gnashing their teeth. It's just an example of the kind of suffering. It's not a matter of annihilation and then nothing goes on. This is a matter of eternal punishment that this is uh, being, uh, that's being depicted uh, in, in verse 42. And then the contrast. But the righteous one. Who are these righteous ones? These are the sons of the kingdom. These who are, are the ones who, who are the, um, through the power of the good seed that was sown have, uh, have uh, borne fruit, believed in Jesus. And uh, these righteous ones, 
here um, will shine. It's a very positive verb. They're going to shine as the sun. It's an image also from Daniel, just like Son of Man is an image from Daniel. Here you have from Daniel 12 this image. They're going to shine like the sun in the kingdom of, um, of their father. And obviously here uh, reference, a Trinitarian reference to uh, God as our heavenly father who has created us and we will be in eternal fellowship with him. And then Jesus often ends a parable, the one having ears, let him hear. There you have the imperative, namely take to heart not only the parable, but also its explanation. And again, the main thing I would say in terms of applying this as you preach it is that the focus of the church is not on witch hunting. It's not on making sure we always have the roles cleared. Anybody that's questionable is out the door. It's primarily on nurturing the sons of the kingdom, the wheat, recognizing there may be hypocrites. And there are hypocrites in the midst, but we don't go on hunts to find them. We, uh, we, have, to, um, we have to let um, uh, God's field grow and recognize in the end, God's finally the judge. He, is the, he can look in the heart and, uh, and, and certainly will bring that kind of um, judgment to, to light. May the Lord bless your proclamation of this parable uh, to his glory.